so we're on 2 Thessalonians. Thess 2. And um, and we're going for it tonight, as they say. He's going for it. Uh, So we're going to look at verses 8 through to and including verse 12, which I shall... um, Ping, which I shall uh, read out. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, uh, it's been a bit controversial, hasn't it? This? I, I actually, when I, when I picked... Uh, first and second Thessalonians didn't really think ahead I thought yeah there's a few verses there but actually it's turned out quite controversial um, because I guess what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks is giving you my understanding or, or what I think is the most plausible um, interpretation of these texts and I, I've found well I was aware anyway that this is perhaps not the most common contemporary interpretation of the scriptures but I will say this again this is not my crazy you know uh, ideas that I'm just delivering to you this is the historic Protestant understanding of these verses and so all I'm doing really is being that sort of conduit and saying look this is what you know I've heard and I think it sounds plausible to me it seems to hold water it seems to hold be consistent in context uh, and so that is why, uh, that is, that, that's what lies behind this. And so I'm just going to um, kind of backtrack a little bit and uh, just in case you'd forgotten what, we, what I was saying last week. So last week we talked about the difference between Antichrist and the son of perdition. Now I said sometimes they're kind of put together as if like when it talks about the son of perdition, oh it's the Antichrist. But I was saying, as far as I can see, that Antichrist is actually a spirit. Um, and this is what people like William Tyndale say. He is a, he is a, it's the spirit of Antichrist. In other words, the one who opposes Christ, but also takes the place of Christ. And so Tyndale um, cites like the Pharisees as being under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, also, the cardinals, the friars, the uh, what they call prelates of the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits, and people like that. Those who, during the time of the Reformation, you know, burnt Christians at the stake. He says, well, this is, you know, they claim to represent Christ, but actually they persecute those who love the gospel. They persecute real Christians and they try and take Christ's place. So, so that, that, that's really what we mean or what I meant when I was talking about Antichrist but then we talked about the son of perdition as being an actual person uh, and I said again drawing on that historic understanding of the scriptures that the person who is the son of perdition is the Pope or that office of Pope maybe not a particular Pope but just that office of Pope uh, and again I just say from the beginning you know this is not I don't hate Roman Catholics. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't wish them harm or anything like that. And in a sense, they are victims, I believe, of that whole religious system. Uh, but you know, I have that. This is this is an exposition of the scriptures. So I'm going to tell you what I believe is being prophesied here. So. Um, 
I said that um, we had this this mystery of iniquity, or the scriptures say the mystery of iniquity that works. Um, uh, and and you remember I said that that iniquity is sin, and uh, the fact that it is a is a mystery um, is the fact that it is working in secret, and it's working in secret in the hearts of those who are actually in the church, actually making up the church, and. In, in, in verse 7, it says, uh, The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And do you remember that I, I said that he um, who's taken out of the way, or him that withholdeth, it says again in, in verse 6, um, w would represent the civil rulers, the emperor, uh, so not Christian rulers, but but s civil authorities. Can't really call them secular because they weren't secular, but but like the emperor, the Roman emperor, and so on. And that once he was removed out of the way, once the Roman em Empire fell, then it left a sort of a vacuum, and then this mystery of iniquity was no longer a mystery. In other words, it was no longer really secret. It was revealed, and that's what it says here, doesn't it? Uh, it says that. Um, and that wicked or that wicked one verse 8 uh, be revealed he shall be revealed because there's nothing then there's no reason for it to be secret then and so the 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 working of this iniquity is revealed in the the rising if you like of the roman catholic church and of course revelation talks about a beast rising out of the mm. sea and again i think that is a picture of the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, the rise of the papacy, to be more specific. I believe the beast represents that rising out of Europe, out, out of that. In, in, in the scriptures, often sea is compared to, uh, you know, peoples, nations, like a sea of people or a sea of faces. That, that's often the, uh, the figure of speech that's being used. And so it says here um, in the second... Uh, Thessalonians that in verse 8 that the Lord and I believe it's talking about the Lord Jesus shall consume this wicked one remember who is the Pope with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming so I want to just go a little bit slowly with this so we can try and picture what is, what's being said so the Lord Jesus shall consume with the spirit of his mouth to consume uh, means means to destroy okay and uh, the spirit of his mouth in other words it's what comes out of his mouth um, in the in in the in Greek quite often there is this almost a play on words between breath and spirit you know that have you seen that in this in the so like words like pneuma right uh with p n e u m a i think pneuma uh meaning spirit um uh, but it can also mean wind it can mean breath and think of like english words like uh pneumatic tires that comes from the greek so like your tires are filled with air so pneuma wind spirit so there's often this kind of flipping around between the, the meaning of these um of these <coughs> words and uh, and and so the spirit of his of, of of the mouth of the Lord is something that's coming out of his his mouth. Just compare it with Isaiah for a second. You get similar sort of language. Um, Isaiah eleven. Isaiah 11 verse 4 says but, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth <coughs> and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked so again this idea of his breath of what is coming out of his mouth being the thing that's going to consume or going to destroy his his adversary right so I'm going to just look into this a little bit 
more. So what is this that, you know, what, what does come out of his mouth? Well, have a look at Revelation chapter 1. <coughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. And this is, you remember, John's vision uh, when he sees uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, the, the, the resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ in his glory. And he says in verse 16 of Revelation 1, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So I don't think it's literal. I think Jesus opens his mouth and, you know, it's a metal sword pokes out. It's obviously, this is a vision uh, and it's saying something. It's kind of a, a bit like a dream, you know, it, it represents something. Uh, and again, similar language in Revelation 19. And verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and, and so on. So you get this picture of this, this, this sword that comes out of Christ's mouth that is going to destroy his adversaries. But I want to just stretch that a little bit and incorporate a, a verse that you might not have thought of, of adding to it, but I think is, is very what shall I say, enlightening. And that's in uh, Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. So Matthew 10, verse, verse 34. So Jesus himself says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a what? Sword. Yeah? A sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now, what is this sword then? That is going to divide families. That is going to make, you know, uh, uh, people who are in a close family turn against each other. Well, I, I think the answer to it, for me, is Hebrews four, verse twelve. Let's have a look. Hebrews four. And it says, for the word of God is quick or, or alive, quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing <clears throat> even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So what comes out of Jesus mouth is what the word of God, what? It's the word of God. It's his teaching, his commands. It's the gospel. Uh, you know, what is it that divides families that sets your sister or your brother against you? Is it not Christ's own teaching, Christ's own words, the word of God, the gospel that some some will accept it and some it, it, it's like a sword that divides. And so what is it that's going to destroy uh, this son of perdition, this 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 person? who through the statements he's made and I'm talking about the Pope and the office of Pope papacy the statements that the Pope makes the the authority that he's given the power that he has uh, the blasphemous things that he says what is going to destroy him the Word of God yeah the gospel the Bible Christ's own words and um, and it will bring about his destruction and if you know your church history you know that's the case you know when 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 the word of god started to be printed 
in people's own languages, particularly like here in the West, in, in England, um, and in Europe, in places like uh, France and Germany, when people got the word of God in their own language and could understand it, the Pope was finished, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the rule and the reign of the, of the Church of Rome was really, the power that they had was, was the writing was on the wall, as they say. Um, now, you might think, hang on, Roman Catholic Church is still here. You know, the Pope's still here. He's on TV all the time and, and so on. Yes, he is, but the power that they had has gone, you know, has, has been undermined to such an extent. It's nothing like, like in the, in, in the Middle Ages, if you lived in Europe, you were under the dominion of the Pope before you could even speak or walk because your parents would take you to their own Catholic church, you'd be christened into that church and, and you'd be christened under the authority of the Pope. So even before you could even rationally say a word, you were under his rule. And, and if you rejected the Pope and said, oh, no, it's not really for me this, forget it. You're, you know, you're gonna spend the rest of your life as a beggar because if, if you were excommunicated, you could neither buy nor sell. Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, you, you couldn't. You, you know, no one would be allowed to sell anything to you. You couldn't buy anything. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, set up a business or, you know, you were literally a, a pauper from that day on. You were a beggar. And, uh, and so that's how huge it was. And he, the Pope, uh, was in charge of, of many of the princes and the kings of Europe. You know, they, they, they paid homage to him. But when the word of God came along and was given in the hands of the common people, that all changed, mm. you know. Um, and so I, I, I think when it talks about his destruction, it's the destruction of that power that he had, the destruction of um, really the power of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it does say, doesn't it, that it's not just Christ's word, but the brightness of his coming or the brightness of his appearing and so some have sort of said well that's got to be when the Lord Jesus returns surely because that's when he's coming and he's going to come you know with a, in his glorified state and so on and you know it's the brightness of his coming but I want to just pause for a moment because we spoke about uh, the kind of language that's being used he will destroy the son of perdition, the wicked one, with the spirit of his mouth. And, you know, I think I've done a fairly robust defence of it being, actually, the words of his mouth. Yeah, so it's not necessarily literally some spirit that comes out of the Lord Jesus' mouth. It's actually what he says, his teaching, his commandments, <coughs> and so on. And so, when you have a passage like this, I think it's important that we don't, we don't become over-literal you know, and start, but we, we start to think, well, what, what could it mean in this context? You know, if what I've said is right so far, it, you know, how can we interpret this in this context? So in just very simple uh, terms, you know, uh, what I would say is, Paul says, we preach, what? We preach Christ. Christ, yeah. We preach Christ. So we don't just preach Christ's words and what he said, but we preach Christ. So in other words, and Christ crucified. So in other words, when we come and we preach the gospel, it's like Christ is there in the presence of, of, of because the gospel is not just words, is it? It's the power of God mm -hmm. unto salvation. Who's the savior of the world? Who, who saves people? It's Jesus. So, so in a sense, when you're preach, because that's when I believe when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand or has come near to you, repent and believe the gospel. It's come near to you in the sense that because the gospel is being preached, the power of God for your salvation is also come near to you. You know, it's attended by, by the spirit of Christ. And so I think when we talk about Christ appearing and the brightness of, of that, that appearing or coming. Um, it can be in terms of the gospel. You know, when the gospel is preached, Christ appears in that sense. And it, it, 
you know, for my own sort of salvation, and, and, and many others who maybe, maybe uh, I'm kind of thinking of you, Carol, because I know your testimony quite well, that when the gospel was preached, Christ appeared mm. to you, as it were, in, in spirit, and you knew it was Christ. Mm. And then you knew you had to make a decision to receive Christ or to refuse Christ. And so I think it's legitimate to say when, you know, he will be destroyed, uh, that, that son of perdition, with, with the brightness of Christ appear, appearing, with the brightness of his coming. Why? Because everything that false religion represents is darkness, isn't it? Yeah, the, the Bible, sin, delusion, uh, ignorance, uh, tends to be represented by darkness. You know, but Jesus says, I am the light of the world, who, who, who shall, whosoever shall follow me shall no longer walk in darkness. So you no longer walk in sin or ignorance or, or under some sort, of, uh, uh, some sort of delusion. A delusion is a false belief because Christ is the truth, isn't he? And so um, when you preach the gospel, you're preaching Christ. And as it were, Christ appears and his, the light of his truth uh, dispels that darkness. It dispels whatever delusion you're under. It dispels the dominion of sin. And therefore it takes away uh, the delusion that, um, that this son of, of perdition uh, was was bringing this false false teaching and so on and the fact that the the word there for destroys uh, can also be translated as uh, brought into nothingness quite like that um, so so everything that he was is now brought into nothingness it, 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 it's you know and I think that's what happened during the time of the Reformation is that all the things that the Roman Catholic Church was and, 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 and the authority that Pope had was brought into nothingness for those that believed. And this mm. is very important for those that received um, the gospel. Now, the Pope still exists. The office of the papacy still exists. But for, for, for us here today, has no effect, does it? We, you know, we can say, yeah, no, I don't agree with the Pope. You know, I'm not interested in what the Roman Catholic Church is saying. But there are others for whom it still has that incredible uh, power. And uh, it talks about, in verse 10 of Second Thessalonians 2, about those that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And, and it says, for those people, those who do not love the truth, verse 9, uh, what they see is, is really the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. In other words, false miracles. And, you know, I can think of so many occasions that, you know, uh, these statues that are supposedly weeping, mm -hmm. um, the stigmata... Um, what else? Um, you know, fake healings, um, uh, supposed um, supposed uh, prophecies by Mary uh, and stuff. I mean, there's just like that side, the sort of supernatural side of Roman Catholicism. There's a whole, there's a, if you know anything about it, there's a whole genre of that sort of mystical side of Roman Catholicism. Uh, and 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 so this is what I think. You know what what are lying signs and wonders? Well, I think they're probably fake. You know, fake signs and wonders, fake healings, and stuff. Uh, and it says here though, uh, that, but behind them is Satan. So maybe some of them could be, could actually be supernatural activity, visions and so on. You know, yeah, maybe it is supernatural, but it's Satan who's who's behind it. And the, person, the people who are being deluded by this are those that, that love not the truth. Um, yeah, they love <coughs> not the truth. Uh, so the, the, when we get to verse 11, it says, And for this cause, in other words, because they love not the truth, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So 
not only does God allow them to be where they are and, and allow them to believe that this is this is the working of, of his spirit but he actually sends or, or allows uh, a, a spiritual delusion there's a spiritual aspect to it and, and I think you can see the same principle in Romans chapter 1 um, Uh, 128 it is and it says and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or not fitting so a reprobate, a reprobate is someone who's cast off by God and so it's saying you know, God, God gives them over to it that's the part of the judgment on them is that God allows them to believe it and in a sense their delusion is made even uh, even more powerful uh, uh, even stronger verse 12 that they all might be damned ja damned means judged yeah that they all might be judged who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness in other words they had pleasure in um, in sin. Now, could this really be the case? Could it really be that we're talking about the Pope? We're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. You know, is it is it really? Has it really been that bad? Do they indulge in lying signs and wonders? Do, do, are they? You know, uh, uh, as again, I'll say it again. I'm not. I'm not. This is not a hate speech against Roman Catholics, or you know, I don't. I don't hate Roman Catholics at all. Uh, but this is what I believe the scriptures are saying. Just turn to Revelation 17. I'll come to the end now. Revelation 17. So think about what I was saying about how the sea or waters <coughs> represents peoples, nations, uh, and think about what we've been saying about um, the other week we were talking about spiritual adultery as well so bear that in mind uh, you know in other words you're you're promised to Christ Christ's bride but you're committing adultery with with somebody else uh, spiritual adultery that is um, so just 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 listen to the this, these verses verse one and there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come hither I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration or, or marvelled. So, almost in every aspect, I feel it answers the historic Roman Catholic Church. Clothed in purple and scarlet. If you ever seen any of the big ceremonies they do, they're all clothed in purple and scarlet. Um, you know the kings of the earth committed fornication with her yet all the kings in Europe were, were all under the rule of the Roman Catholic Church and in the sway of uh, the Pope uh, gold, pearls, precious stones yeah it's just absolutely brimming with it Roman Catholic Church and, uh, and, and, and so on but the, the thing is here verse 5 it talks about this, this woman and, and remember we are the bride of Christ here is a different kind of bride, a different kind of woman. Um, she is a harlot, and she is the mother of harlots. And uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that the Roman Catholic Church is the first example 
of that sort of harlotry, spiritual harlotry, whereby they claim to represent Christ, they claim to be the church of Christ, uh, and yet they, they bring to themselves blasphemous uh, doctrines. The Pope has blasphemous titles, you know, Holy Father and, you know, the Vicar of Christ, meaning the one who's in the place of Christ. You know, he claims to be the head of the church and many, many other, you know, uh, titles that we could, we could talk about. And so really the Roman Catholic Church is the first of this kind of religious organisation, if you like, um, that, that, it, that, that, that is created by that mystery of iniquity just being allowed to just come out and, and not be with, withheld and just give its full potential, if you like. And, you know, today I look at things like uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, uh, the Church of Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, or Mormons, uh, you know, and all other kinds. These are all uh, spiritual harlots, but the Roman Catholic Church is the mother of those harlots because she was the first. And again, you know, no, I don't hate Jehovah's Witnesses. I've talked to many, many JWs, and uh, either in the Watchtower or coming out of the Watchtower. No, I don't hate Mormons. I spoke to many Mormons as, as, as well. But this is what I believe the prophecies of the Bible are warning about and saying, look, don't you get sucked. In fact, the fact it says, in, I think it's in Revelation 17, come out of her, my people. You know, if you're, if you, if you're in that church, then come out. You know, don't follow the same judgments that are going to uh, come upon her but rather you know love the truth um, love love Christ who is the truth and so you know not everybody loves the truth some people just want a big organization to belong to you know some people just want power or money or whatever it is or what is it like uh, Diotrephes uh, he want he wants the preeminence mm. you know but if you want the truth then you're not going to be fooled by these these lying signs and wonders. You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be seeking after the spirit of Antichrist. You're going to want the real Christ. And when the real Christ confronts the false Christ, the false Christ will be destroyed <coughs> by the sword of his mouth, by by his word, by this. People out there in YouTube land, by the Bible, yeah, by by the gospel. That will destroy any. It will destroy JW's arguments, it will destroy Mormon's arguments, it will destroy Christadelphian's arguments, it will destroy Seventh-day Adventist arguments, because this is the word of truth, mm. you know, and that's how Jesus does it, that's how he consumes the spirit of Antichrist, that's how he consumes the son of perdition, is by the sword of his mouth.